I'm joined by George Barr, a Marine Corps veteran who served in the Kore during the Korean War era. So uh, thanks for being here, George. I appreciate you coming in and yeah, your willingness pleasure. to share your story. Sure. Um, so you served in the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. What made you choose the Marine Corps? Well, <clears throat> during the war, I grew up during World War II, of course. Uh, and I saw all that was happening with the uh, Marines in the, the Pacific and what they were up against. And it looked to me like one of the best fighting units uh, from what I read and you know, saw the pictures of what they accomplished. So when I was about, that was about 13 or 14. It really was my decision at that point. I was trying to decide what branch of the military is going to serve it because I wanted to serve my country. Okay. And I wanted to get in, you know, obviously it, it didn't last till I it was old enough. Uh, but uh, I thought it wasn't the uniform either that attracted me. It was the uh, the uh, spirit and the uh, the way <coughs> they were depicted in the uh, news and in the magazines that I got. Sure. Encouraged me to decide to join the Marine Corps. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit about your basic training. Oh, that was that was fun. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I I had no idea what I was getting into, but uh, <clears throat> I joined in the uh, summer of 1948, June, and I spent. 12 or 13 weeks down at Paris Island, which was uh, very hot down there. And of mm -hmm. course, we had to contend with all the uh, uh, sand fleas and the, the bugs. And you weren't, in the training, you weren't allowed to kill those animals. <laughs> you know, we, we were told directly, those insects have family. You can't, you can't <laughs> do that. But uh, I, I spent, uh, from uh, June till uh, August in training. Uh, and after training, uh, they said, we don't have orders for you, so go home. So I, <clears throat> they gave me a 10-day leave to go home and come back, which I wasn't too happy about. I didn't want to go back down there. <laughs> <laughs> but the the training was, it was tough, and they, some of the stories you hear are not exaggerated at all about what happens at uh, the training down there at Paris Island. It's, uh, they give you a pretty good uh, run for your money. Okay. But uh, I felt good after, after getting out of there. And so after your basic training, what was your, what was your MOS or your? Uh, uh, 0311, which is uh, infantryman. Yep. And as you probably, I don't know if you ever heard this or not, but all, all Marines are trained to be riflemen, uh, basically. <coughs> That's the, uh, one, of the, one of the big factors that uh, I think helps in the Marine Corps. Uh, we go through two weeks of uh, rifle training, one week with, without firing a, a bullet, and the, the second week is when you do your firing and qualifying. So, uh, I, I don't know if they still do now, but the Army, I think, was uh, seven, seven or eight weeks, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, seven days, not, not uh, when they trained for the uh, rifle. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I don't, know if the, I don't know if they've changed that or not, but that's one of the, one of the factors that the Marines really focus on is uh, using the rifle and uh, being accurate. Okay. So, did your uh, I know you served as a military police. Uh, yeah, my most of my career was uh, uh, security or MPs. Uh, when I uh, my first uh, duty station was uh, they they sent me to uh, what they call C school to get trained to uh, be a part of a, a detachment on the on the. Uh, a uh, large Navy ship, either a carrier or a battleship. And that was a month of training 
down at uh, uh, Horseman uh, Naval Shipyard in Virginia. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, they assigned me to a carrier that uh, was permanently docked at uh, Quonset Point, Rhode Island. Uh, the, the carrier was the Philippine Sea, CV-47. And that uh, duty on the ship was security also. We, we, ma uh, we, <coughs> we manned the uh, brig. Uh, we were ex executive orderly on the ship or, or uh, captain's orderly. And we also had a battle station. So uh, the uh, first battle station I had was uh, one of the 40 millimeter uh, weapons. And I spent uh, uh, almost two years on the uh, signs of the permanent detachment on the ship, which I enjoyed. That was probably one of the best parts of my uh, duties in the Marine Corps for the four years I was serving. So what made it special for you? Well, I like being... Yeah, one of the things before I uh, signed up for the Marine Corps, I said, I'd like to be on a ship and, <clears throat> but, uh, and travel. And as it turned out, I got assigned to a, I, but they didn't want to join the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> I but, won't hold it against you. <laughs> not that I had any against the Navy, because <laughs> my brother was a uh, Navy corpsman. Uh, but, uh, and I, I, got, I got both choices that I was looking for. Not, not that they gave me those choices, I, it just happened that way. So, uh, plus I, I liked uh, doing on the guard, uh, which we did that whenever we had uh, people on, dignitaries coming on the ship, we'd have to uh, follow for uh, on the guard inspection by the world was visiting. Okay. And I'll tell you a little story about uh, when we were in, the ship operated in, in the Mediterranean. So we went over there for about uh, four months. And <clears throat> we pulled into France. Uh, and who comes aboard or gets invited on our ship by a captain was Rita Hayward. Uh -huh. So. Everybody wanted to have their duty that night. <laughs> <laughs> but she came aboard with a full-length uh, mink fur coat on. <laughs> and beautiful as ever. And of course, the captain rushed her off to his, <laughs> his quarters up, up over the hangar deck. So we never got to see much more of her. But I enjoyed the, uh, the travel. That, that was one of the things I was looking for. Okay. Very good. I didn't want to be in one place for any length of time if I could help it. Sure. So, you know, you you always thought about serving your country. I did. And you wanted to serve your country. That was in my mind, you know, throughout World War II. Um, what, what really prompted that feeling in you? Well, I, I felt it was part of my duty you know, for, for the, uh, what we have to offer here in this country and, and uh, you know, the freedom we have. And I said, uh, I want to do something for the war effort. And I guess the, the, only th the best thing to do would be to join one of the branches of the military. So that was my, that was my goal during World War II. Okay. Uh, to serve my country and pay kind of pay, pay back for the, all the good things we have here in this country. Sure. So how about your family? Um, you know, you mentioned your brother. Um, any other family members that served in the military? Yes. My younger brother, he served in the Army. Uh, he, he was about six years younger than me. So uh, growing up, I never really got to know him. Because when I came out of the Marine Corps, he had just signed up for the Army. So he was gone. So. So there was about a, uh, an eight-year period there that we had very, very little contact with. Okay. But yeah, he's, he's the only. I had uh, just two brothers and a sister. Okay. And 
They both served in the military, my boys, my brothers. Excellent. Um, but that, that was the toughest part, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, we were faced with sandstorms and a lot of the... Uh, uh, and I think this is a picture of you that, that's me serving at, at China Lake. That's me at that's China Lake at the main gate, yeah. And, you You're a very sharp-looking guy. We, uh, yeah, there's a booth there that I'm in front of, and I, I stood many a gate, main gate duty on there. Yeah. But also keeping the, uh, keeping the sailors in, in line was, was not easy. They can be a tough crowd. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, it's funny because <clears throat> a few years ago, I went back out to California to visit the, the not to visit the base there, they were going to dedicate a uh, uh, drill instructor's statue at San Diego. Okay. And a buddy of mine uh, in the Marine Corps, he, he designed it and had it, had it all set up to be installed. So I went out for the installation. I said, I'll go out and check my uh, old base out at China Lake, see what it looks like today. And believe it or not, I, I, they had security police. At that point, there were no military people doing the Security on the base was all military. Okay. I mean, all the private. Yeah. So uh, the guard at the uh, main gate, I went over to him and I said, uh, "Do you mind if I check out the uh, the guard booth?" And that guard booth hadn't hadn't changed a bit <laughs> from 1950 <laughs> to I think it was like 2008 or something like wow. that. I said, "It's just exactly the same as when I was a." Uh, an MP here so you, on the you gate. you fit right in. <laughs> I says, nothing's changed except that now your security is on the... They had, we had a... Uh, that base was, I don't know if you, uh, you realize it or anybody realized it, but I never heard of it. The uh, second atomic bomb, uh, Fat Boy, uh, Fat Man, was built, uh, part of it was built on that base hmm. at China Lake. Yeah, everybody thinks of it. New Mexico is where the uh, the bombs were, were all built. But and uh, I found I didn't find that out till I went out to visit that base uh, many wow. many years later. As you know, as you know sometimes you, you we were adding stuff that we had no idea what was going on. Sure. Because we had to be uh, uh, interviewed and uh, documented by the FBI to get top uh, not top secret but secret uh, security. Sure. For what we were doing, but uh, this this uh, Charlie Lake is it's still a naval weapons test station. Uh, it's grown, uh, but the, uh, the the sandstorms out there were horrendous. We we had open barracks, so we we wound up uh, shoveling sand out of the hallways every almost day. every after every storm. Like, like snow, only it was all sand. <laughs> so what was probably the most, um, what would you say would be the most rewarding part of your military service? Well, I have to say probably being assigned to seagoing because at, at that point in time, uh, there were, uh, was a select position. Uh, you had to be six feet tall, and you had to meet the qualifications to uh, be part of the uh, ship uh, company okay. uh, detachment. So the f fact that I fell into the uh, fact that I was going to be on, uh, traveling a lot, <coughs> and I, I like the ocean. So I, I like being on the ocean, I, I got a lot of the uh, things I was hoping I, c I could get. That, that kind of made me happy. Oh, good, good. Uh, so when you look at your life prior to the military, and then once you were released from your military duties, how would you say your personal life changed? Well, it obviously it uh, taught me a lot of discipline and uh, how to manage your, your life and how to uh, you know, help others too. Uh, but I, I think uh, the discipline part of it was the best for me. Because 
it, it, it's helped me in my uh, work and it helped me in, in uh, my private life in dealing with people. Okay. Um, tell, me, tell me a little bit more about that. So your interactions with others and your military service, um, you know, I, I thoroughly understand the discipline part. Yeah. Uh, but were there other things that, that kind of helped you along the way? or other people that influenced you along the way? Um, there was a, a gunnery sergeant on the ship who I <coughs> really had nothing to do with him personally, or, or, or you know, you, you, he didn't do anything with the, uh, uh, he was like a god. Uh, but, uh, after I got out of the military, I. I uh, joined the uh, Philippine Sea Association, which was the ship I was on, okay. and he was—he had belonged to it too, and we kind of got together and became very good friends. And we used to go to the uh, reunions together. Uh, something I, I thought would never—I'd never see, uh, you know, being friendly with the uh, uh, my yeah. previous gunning sergeant sure. because he was a—he was fair. Fair guy, but he was he was tough. Mm -hmm. and he he taught me a, a few things. So. Very good. So you had family that served in World War II, and you served in Korea. So the Korean War has always been referred to as the Forgotten War. Right. So did you experience that when you came home? Or how, how was your military service perceived by others when you returned home? Well, it's interesting you ask that because I went in 1948, and of course there was no nothing going on at that point in time. And uh, I have to say the uh, general public, uh, people I ran into, kind of looked down on the military, not just the Marines, but all military as kind of you, had, you you couldn't get a job or something like that, so you, you joined the the uh, service. But that wasn't the case. But uh, when the Korean War broke out, a totally different attitude, in my perception anyway. I don't mm -hmm. know if anybody else perceived the same. I never talked to anybody about it, but uh, people couldn't do enough for you. Okay. Wherever you went, if you went to a, a restaurant or a bar or, or a coffee shop, they wanted to buy, pay for your meal or pay for whatever. Before that, they, t they kind of ignored you okay. and made no attempt to be friends with you or talk to you, uh, which I thought very strange, you know, because uh, just because there's no war around, there's no, no reason to look down on the military. Sure. But uh, that, uh, that was my perception of uh, the general public okay. uh, that I uh, had encountered. So. And how about your transition from the military to civilian life? How was that? It, it worked out well. I, you know, when I first came out of the, uh, the military, I, I had two or three, um, not big jobs, but uh, uh, I transitioned into a, a, a good job with Polaroid. I went to work for Polaroid for a couple of years. But my, in, my intention, uh, before I went to uh, Polaroid, I went uh, to training at Mass Radio and TV for electronics. And the job I took at Polaroid had nothing to do with what I went to school for. Okay. But it was, it was a job, and it paid well. So I, I stayed with them for a couple of years with the intent of uh, getting something in the, the field of electronics. Uh, so I, I decided that I'll try the uh, telephone company. So that's what I did. I, I, uh, I got uh, hired with the telephone company at a very low salary to begin with, but, but the, uh, the ultimate uh, salary would be, would be very good later on after about two or three years. Okay. You could automatic raises. So that's that's why I spent the next 40 or 50 years with the uh, telephone company. 
Very good. And that electronic uh, school I went to uh, uh, helped me in, in, in the job I was in. Very good. So you really didn't face a lot of challenges coming back, would you say? Not really, no. Okay. No. no. And <clears throat> how would you, um, what would you relay to the younger generation, I guess? Not to put an age range on people, but the younger generation. Right. What would you have to say to them about serving in the military? <clears throat> well, sir, I'm glad you asked me that because it's uh, anybody I've talked to, I encourage to put, put two or three years into the in military after you graduate from high school. Um, and I'm a firm believer in we should have, this country should have universal military training for every, every uh, youngster coming out of school uh, they don't have to uh, <clears throat> they don't have to go into the military but uh, it, at least put in two to three years doing service to the, uh, the the community or the country like the the uh, uh, but I, I try to encourage any kids I talk to I, I try to you know tell them that the best thing would to happen to you would be to get military training, I said. And, and even if you're only going for two or three years, I, I think three years is, is really what you should do because two is not, really not enough to get the full treatment of the feeling in the military. <clears throat> but the... Uh, so what would they be receiving if they did that? I what would be some of the benefits? Well, it would give them training and discipline, how to get along with people, how to work as, definitely how to work uh, as a team. Mm -hmm. uh, that you're not going to be able to do it all by yourself. Uh, you, your best uh, bet is work with somebody. Uh, there's nothing better than, uh, you know, they put, you know, working with a team and, and to reach an objective. and. And also overcoming differences. Yes, yes, yes. You get the, unfortunately, when I first went in, there, there was a lot of discrimination, uh, but that changed. I think in 1949, just before the Korean War. <clears throat> but the, uh, I think the training and the, uh, how to get along with people, how to work as a team, uh, is the best benefit. And even if you don't plan to stay in the military. That, that training will be with you forever. Mm -hmm. And you still have the rest of your life ahead to go to college or uh, any other kind of training you wish to go into. Sure. So two, that, that two or three years out of your life is, is, is not going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. But uh, unfortunately, they, I, I think they try to uh, uh, put in universal training many years ago, but somehow it just no work. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I think that's the best thing that could happen to all of our youngsters. Mm. Uh, okay. And they, they don't, like I say, they don't have to go into the military, but at least into an organization that is, is doing like uh, uh, charity work or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and give back something to the community or the country. Sure. That's nice. Um, what would you like people to know about George Barr and your service in the Marine Corps? About my service? Yep. Well, I just want them to know that uh, I felt that uh, it's really everyone's duty to give back to this country for all that we get and all the freedoms we enjoy. And we're free to, uh, uh, we have the freedom of choices, we're, what we want to do, where we want to go. And that, that was my uh, belief that uh, I felt I, I couldn't get into World War II because uh, I wasn't old enough, obviously. but. Uh, that 
that uh, that training, I I, uh, I would do it again. I would do it again. Very good. Well, so George, I want to thank you for your time today. It's been great. Um, I appreciate you sharing your stories with us. Um, mm -hmm. That was my my. Uh, I'm happy to do it. Sure, and um, you know, just your your service. Um, I thank you. You know, it's it's tough for those Korean and Vietnam vets too, right? Because I think you you missed out on a lot. Um, that you know, sometimes your service isn't recognized or valued as much as it should be. Right, right. But I want to thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. All right.